Hello, everybody. Uh, tonight, we're going to have a, a great guest. We actually have been him once before on another show. And uh, he's amazing, and we figured that we'd bring him back again. All right, are you live? We're live. Got him? We're, uh, we're good. We're good? Just a second. I have to be a full radio guy. Sorry about that. We're still live. We're still live. Give me just two seconds, and we're good to go. see, we have the other one. It's still up here. It's messing with everything. Wow, the wind down here is ridiculous. We kicked my last show out a couple of times. <clears throat> and, ladies and gentlemen, we're experiencing technical difficulties. Please stand by. I think we have been well and built in our chat room. Yes, we have been well and built in our chat room. We've been looking at the show in the room. <laughs> so, my trip is taking place tonight, Nick. I'll tell you, okay, you want to talk about getting my ears twisted? Somebody put the money in. Okay, you're live. You're live. Uh, you're live. Right. Okay, here we go. Hi, my name is Chris James, and I'm David McCoy, and Victor of Woods Family, who is now also known as the Velvet Penny Bear. Welcome to our show. This is the Second Sight Radio. It's 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we are live from New York City for the next. To um, you listen to DJ with the radio.com and watching us on Tesla with the radio.com. Uh, we don't have a call number tonight, I don't think. Um, but it's, is it the video on call number? No, no, we really can't do a call tonight. Okay, we'll call them. Yeah, we have a jump over the week. We have the birthday segment and we have the church and stuff and say, and let me tell you something, people, I'm pissed with this one. So, um, it should be good. Um, my Facebook fan page is Psychic Medium, of course, just give a like, maybe I'll give you a few readings. I give away about, I don't know, I'd say a different number of readings to get to change the women. Probably the women get between six and ten for readings a week, and plus, I, you know, if people have problems, and they ask me a question, I always help them out. So, give them a page a like, and I can help you out too. Uh, of course, we have Victor the Voice Family's fan page, which is Victor the Voice Family, and uh, give that a like as well. And we have a group page, which is just called Second Sight. Like it, people. It's a kick-ass page. I put up a lot of cool stuff up there about meditation, um, shower people, poker guys, demons, uh, possession, all different types of things. Get on it. It's a really, really cool page. Anyway, we have birthdays. We have famous birthdays this week. You know what? There's a whole bunch of them. There's a lot. As far as I'm concerned, there's only one that's really important. So anyway, we have Jim Morrison, who's a really cool dude. We have Sammy Davis Jr., part of the rap pack, which, you know, I'm a huge fan of the rap pack. We've got Kurt Douglas, we have Red Fox, we have John Kelly, we have Taylor Swift, Big Man Dyke, Ted Nugent, Mr. Domus. We have Connie Francis. Now, something interesting about Connie Francis. Um, for those of you that know, she was a singer back in the 60s and uh she was a beautiful woman. Uh, she hit so many hard times. You know, a bunch of people in her family raped her and really screwed her up. Well, my dad actually um, gave her singing lessons. And uh, they were good friends back in the day. So, you know, happy birthday to Connie Francis and Bob Man, the chairman of the board. You know who that is, right, Victor? Yes, you're the chairman of the board. You are. Who punched me? Oh, Frank Sinatra. Uh, it's Sinatra's birthday, so I want to give a big uh, Happy birthday. And one of our favorite guests, Dr. Eben Alexander. It's his birthday today. Eben Alexander. Hey, oh, guess what? It was my birthday this week, too. Chris, it was your birthday. How old are you, Chris? I'm an old bastard. I'm, I just turned 46. Oh, my God. You're so old. Yes, I'm 46. <laughs> well, Chris, I, Chris, Chris, I have a surprise for you. I'm going to serenade you. In the oh, no, 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 no. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Godfather of Psychic Medium. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Voice. The double thing I appreciate that. Um, you know, I'm not one for really celebrating my birthday, but, you know, my, my girlfriend, Chrissy, she came over, she got a kid, she got a daughter, um, saying happy birthday to me, and, Got me a nice sense of an NRC t shirt and a jet t shirt and a jet mug and a bunch of cigars. You know, everyone knows I love my cigars and a couple other things. So I want to say thank you to her as well. Um, okay, my thought for the week the best thing in life is not ending up alone. It's ending up with someone who makes you feel alone. 
And, you know, I put that, I, I made that my third the week because I'm with somebody now who makes me feel great every day. Always makes me smile, always happy. You know, she, she whatever you say, you know, you probably heard you say this, but she told me that it was okay to be happy. Yeah. And I said that because when I was with, when the person I was with before her, even though I was with her for three years, I felt alone for three years. And I was beat down by this person verbally and whatever, and I stuck around with a moron. Yeah. So, shut up, I didn't ask you. Anyway, so, <laughs> anyway, don't, no, no, nobody likes me, as you can see. But, um, so, so that's why I actually uh, put this up because, you know, this is somebody who made me feel like, um, you know, like, I'm, like you're supposed to feel when you with somebody, so it's just really cool. Does she, make you feel, does she make you feel like a natural woman? That's all I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Rick, uh, uh, I won't go there. I'm not going to answer that one. Hey. All right, so, so, um... Last week. Last week. Who did we have last week? Debbie Chestnut. Yeah, she was a great guest. Stalking Shadow. She was a great guest, great book, and for those of you who uh, haven't had a chance, go out and get that book, Stalking Shadows. Uh, and we actually have a copy that we're going to give away, and uh, nobody claimed it, so we still have a copy of Stalking Shadows to give away. And all we have to do is send an email to contest at secondsightradio.com. That's contest at secondsightradio.com. Uh, put the word in shadow in the subject line or in the body of the email, and you get a free copy of the book. Yeah, you got something wrong with them? Absolutely. Uh, Test the Wolf Media is going to be giving away a Roku 3 here in the very near future to one of our lucky viewers. Wonderful. Outstanding, outstanding. Oh, and, and we have t-shirts now. This is from Second Sight. That's right. And um, we have the link for that we can get people. It's really easy. ParanoiaMagazine.com. Go to the shop and click on T-shirts. It'll take you right there. There you have it, people. Listen, support Second Sight. We're, we're a great show. Um, we're the pretty cool co-host. I was a fan of this show myself. And um, the shirts, the shirts are really kick ass. You know, I don't know. I'm just playing around a little bit and just kind of manifest it and. And why do you like it? Because we use the show with it, absolutely. That's what it is. You really were inspired with the cut-out nipples. I think that was really inspired. You know, man, I'm the nipple man, so I mean, what can I tell you? <laughs> no, they're, they're people that are asking, they're people like, I'm the nipple man. 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 i He's a psychic. He's a seasoned paranormal investigator. The Colonel Patrick Allen will salt and pepper him. He's well seasoned. He's a spiritual advisor, a hypnotherapist, a law of attraction and life coach. He co hosts the Everything Paranormal Show with his brother Mark. And if that's not enough, he lives in a haunted house. And for those of you watching on Wolf, uh, that's the Wolf Media right now, you can see him sitting in that haunted house. Good evening, Jeff. Good evening, Jeff. How are you doing well tonight? Hey, how you guys doing? You know, it's been really, really well. You know, Jeff, I'm not friends with the Devin Mark on Facebook, and I really need to get that taken care of. Um, and when I was driving home tonight, I was thinking to myself, you know, I, I would really like to dig up some dirt on Jeff and maybe, you know, you know, bring him on the show a little bit. But I wasn't friends with Mark, and I was driving, and I really couldn't, you know, make that connection. But um, I'm just warning you. I'm going to send you, brother. I'm going to get a little bit on you, and the next time you're on the show, you're getting a zinger. Yeah, there's plenty of people, but I'm laughing if you can get there from, but, uh, yeah, it's just way back. We, we got pretty dirty, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I know, listen, you're very good, Ken. You know, I'm going to bring you out loud and dirty. So, Vic, you want to tell us a bit of you? Yeah, Jeff, for our listeners on Circus Sight, because they don't know you, they're meeting you for the first time, and some of them are meeting you for the first time, tell us if you've got interest in the paranormal in field. Uh, we got interested, me and my brother, in a bit of frame, um, we used to work at this warehouse that I used to say, hey, Jeff, you got to come check this place out, it's haunted, there's a red screen, there's like all kinds of stuff going on, it was a, um, it was a warehouse that used to hold clothing, it was like, uh, one of those catalog places, so there was stuff going on in the wax, there was clothes moving and all kinds of stuff, so I'm like, yeah, whatever, we'll go check it out. So we went there, he had a recorder, and we were walking around at night, and the first thing we heard was we heard a scream come from uh, the other side of the building. Like, what the hell was that? And 
So, you know, we went and checked it out. And, I mean, that's kind of what I started to get. I was like, I, I feel like, you know, in different spots. You know how when you go on an investigation, you go in some room, and you can't breathe. The other ones, they feel, like, lighter. And so that's kind of where that all started to develop. But I didn't really know what was going on then. So from there, we got into uh, a meetup group where we ended up going to different places and that's where I kind of got my claim to fame is uh, he went to the Sausage King I was telling you guys about with the team, the hundred. And uh, I went up to Maine, up to Parsem. It's a boys' seminary that mm -hmm. is like a lot of crazy energy there. And I mean, that, that's where things really kicked in for me that, you know, I started to feel things and started to work with energy. I, I met Father Williams up there who started to teach me some stuff. And so it kind of took off from there and, you know, then everything else kind of evolved. So, I mean, since then, I mean, we've been on hundreds of investigations. We do mostly private stuff, though. Um, I don't know. I mean, what's your guys' opinion on these public places? Um, I, I like them. Uh, I just think that too many people go there and don't, don't respect them. Yeah, uh, I, I love doing the. I love doing those. I, I, I like doing private stuff. I love it. Yeah. Well, my, my my take is there are two types of paranormal teams. There are people who are professional paranormal teams who really yeah. understand the nature of the work and who are really in the work to help people because that's not about finding just finding paranormal uh, phenomena, finding uh, evidence. Uh, it's about helping people and helping them. Uh, understand what's happening in their homes, making them comfortable, uh, proving or disproving anything that may be there, and then giving them some alternatives and solutions and finding ways of, of, of getting rid of any fear and, and anything that's happening there. And then there are the amateur teams, the people who uh, watched Ghost Hunters 10 years ago and said, that's what I want to do, and they went out and they bought equipment and uh, run around like uh, Blanchies, and uh, they love the public investigations because they, that's an opportunity for them to do whatever the hell they please, and unfortunately it must be good. Yeah, so, I, I, Chris, I, go ahead. I, I, I get out of a lot of the uh, public ones because I cross them all over and they get pissed at me. But it, they treat them like, like, uh, like it's a zoo, like it's, they're, they're kept animals, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. they're, they're basically the same spirits as we are. They're just, they're just not physical anymore. So, I mean, these people that are, you know, making their money off of them, I mean, there, there's a house in Massachusetts that there's a lot of stuff going on, and they were supposed to be using money to fix the house, and now but they never did, did they? No, they, yeah, they never did. They just took the money, and that's it. But you know what? They, they, it's a business for them, and you know, I'm gonna tell you something. I don't force them to make me a business. If they want to make money off of it, I have no problem with that. But you have to be, you have to be respectful when you're there. You can't treat it like it's a joke, and you can't. You know, get all crazy, and you know, I, I've seen people go on, on these big investigations, and you know, like for instance, uh, when I met Victor, we did um, an investigation at a at a psychiatric hospital, an abandoned psychiatric hospital. Yeah. And you know, Victor, I don't think I ever told you this, but you, you know the one who's on the other network now instead of us. Yes. You know, I'm walking by. I had a whole group of people with me. Victor, when we went into that room where we had the banging happening, remember that? Yes. Okay, we passed another room, and there was that one guy, who I won't mention his name because, you know, it's irrelevant at this point, but he's there peeing. He's peeing on the friggin' wall, you know, and I wanted to knock the shit out of him, but we had about 40 people on this investigation that we had broken up into groups and everything, and, you know, that would have made me look bad. It would have made second sight look bad, so I didn't do it. But, you know what, I tuned his ass up after the, after the investigation. I grabbed him and I told him, I said, this is the last investigation you ever coming on with us. You absolutely disrespected this place. I said, you know what it, 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 it took me to get us into this place? And then you're going to go and pee on the walls? I mean, really? On a wall? In yeah. yeah, you're pee in on a wall. Room. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and you know me, I don't think that crap. So, it, you know, I didn't say that. That's ridiculous. But I tuned his ace up there because you better believe it. I mean, we're not friends today, and that has a lot to do with it. But, you know, um, yeah, I, I just want it's too bad the ween it's too bad the weenie demon wasn't in that room. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a good but you know, Victor, Victor, I wanna to just touch on something that, that you mentioned. You know, I think the most important thing goes back to Jeff saying, you know, he, you know, about investigating private homes. Um, and you touched upon it saying people don't go for alternatives. People don't go for the assistance after you do the investigation. And I think that's 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 horrible. Um 
when you go into a private residence, you're going there to help people. You're not going in to quote unquote hunt ghosts, which is a, a term I, I absolutely despise. Okay. You're going there to help these people figure out what's going on in their home and then try and help them afterwards. It's not about going there and getting evidence. It's like, oh, I got an EVP reporting. Oh, yeah, great. It's not about that. It's about getting that evidence, figuring it out, and then helping these people to look at whatever problems going on in their home. And I just find that a lot of these groups today, they just don't do that. It's not yeah. part of their, of their um, not, repertoire or, or how do you want to say it. Not, not only that, and I'm sure Jeff will, will pipe in on this, but the Bill and Danielle show last night, they were talking, the gentleman that they had on was talking about these people who go in and actually pretend they find something or, or make it worse by finding nothing and, and saying they found something uh, and leaving the family in a worse situation than they were before they arrived. And the whole idea is if you're going to somebody's private home, be respectful, don't make up anything, don't add to the fear, try and take away the fear, try and leave them in a situation of peace and comfort in their homes. And if there's nothing paranormal, don't claim there's something paranormal there. And as we know, the majority of the home investigations we go on have absolutely nothing paranormal. You know, I I want to bring something up. um, I can remember... And you were there. I'm not going to mention that names again. Kathy in the chat room was there. But we're going to a home where somebody says that there's demons and what there's no demons. But we brought somebody with us. And right away she went, oh, my God, I feel the energy. Oh, my God, so, I feel easy. <laughs> and absolutely terrified this person who lived there. Absolutely terrified them. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm like, why, why would you do that? What, is it do you want to be noticed? Is it, is it a theatrical thing? I don't know. That, that's something else that really bothered me because she scared the hell out of this woman but she had nothing to be scared of. Yeah, well, most of us are not in this field anyway, but at least we don't make the people feel mad. What I do when I go on an investigation is I'll go around, I'll see what I feel, see what I see, and then I go to the people. I mean, I don't talk to the people before. You know, like I have my brother or whoever, our group, is. you know, they talk to them, and then I'll come to them. And I'll say, you know, it's like, do you see shadows in the, that go from the kitchen and they go quick? And, you know, or um, was there an old man that died recently that, you know, he's kind of an asshole and he, he you know, like, oh, yeah, my uncle. And, and I make them, I validate their feelings first, and I make them feel that they're not crazy. I mean, I did one in, in Cape Cod that was, I mean, it's, it's like I never met these people. It was when I was part of New England Ghost, and we worked our way to the top of it. And actually, we're building New England Ghost up again, but we're going to start fresh. But um, so I went to this thing in Cape Cod, and I didn't know anybody there. And it's like, uh, you know, I feel somehow there's water involved in this. Like, no, 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 we live here. This is the tallest, the highest place. And I was like, oh, I just going to shut up now. And so <laughs> then... Uh, I said, hey, well, you know, I see three spirits here, and it's like I see like a trail going back and forth from that house, but I see three spirits that they're not related, and it it was weird, and it's like, oh, I, 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 whatever. So as the time went on, the lady came out, and I'm like, is um, do you know of a, like a blonde haired boy that is, is that that died? And she goes, my uncle drowned when he was five. And it's like, and he had blonde curly hair. I'm like, cool, that solves a lot. So that's leads me off of that. And then um, I'm like, there's kind of an old guy that, you know, he's he's just really nasty. And he just goes, I think that would be my uncle. And I'm like, and then there's, I, I see that, is there a woman that used to live next door? And then it's like, yeah, the woman died. She fell down the stairs. And they think that her husband murdered her, but there was never any charges pressed in. Her path was she just walked back and forth to that house. Mm-hmm. And then it's like I, I really wowed him at the end. I'm like, have you been talking to angels lately and you have proof? And she goes, yeah, I have a picture of that. There's an angel over my mantle. And I'm like, well, I had a good night tonight. <laughs> yeah, you ever have those nights and you just spot on? Absolutely. You get everything? Absolutely. So if I want to tie back to your talking about your, your starting to develop your abilities um, visiting that seminary. What, what exactly happened? What do you think that seminary was the launching point for you? Uh, that was, we went there, I, I've been there like three or four times. And the first time I went, you know, I was just beginning and just kind of checking things out. And it's 
I swear I met uh, Joni Mayan and Sandy, I was telling you last time, I met them, all, you know, the New England Ghost people. And I was up in a room that they call the barbershop room because it has a barbershop chair in it. And mm-hmm. it's, it's really nasty chair. And then there's this little creepy one. Um, remember the guy in Fargo, the little creepy guy? I don't know if you guys remember the movie Fargo. Yeah, yes. yeah. But he's a little creepy guy with a weird teeth. That's kind yeah. of what the little one reminded me of. And so we were in there, and uh, Joni started to get real uncomfortable. Like this thing was like, you know, kind of trying to get into her and attack her and stuff. Because I mean, so what happened was, you know, she, she goes, "Oh, we gotta leave," and you know, the ghost box kept saying, "F you, F you to us." And so, like, "Oh, we gotta leave." So I'm like, "Oh no, okay, so we can leave." As we were leaving, it felt like there was somebody like right behind us. You know how when you're lying in a coffee shop and there's somebody that's like, too close to you and you take a step forward, they take a step forward, and, and they're just like yeah. in your space? And then like, really? Do you have to be that close to me? But anyway, so that's what it felt like. It followed us right out of the building and we were like, just all scared. Right? And we had this guy there that he was a skeptic, and which was fine. He goes, oh, I really don't believe this. I, you know, he was respectful about it. He goes, you know, I just really need to see something. He got in his car at 4 in the morning. He wouldn't even sleep there. He got in his car at 4 in the morning and drove four hours to go home. And everyone's like, well, shouldn't he doesn't crash and fall asleep. He goes, like, are you kidding me? He's white knuckled all the way home. I love that. that. That's something I really love. Um, it is the skeptic. Uh, especially if they're, if they're respect, respectful. He was. He was a very nice guy, and he was respectful about it. He wasn't, like, rude about it. Dick, I want to ask you a question. Do you remember the time we were at the Chrysler Mansion, and uh, that one group of, 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 they were young, I guess in their 20s, they, they were very nice, they were respectful people, um, and the one guy was like, oh, you're the psychic medium, Chris George, I don't believe in anything you do, I don't believe in anything about psychics, I don't believe in haunted. I don't even know why are you here. He just said, I want you to prove to me that there's something on the other side. I said, well, I'm not into proving anything. I'm here to, you know, do an investigation. Whatever happens, happens. I said, but I'll tell you what. How about you just stay by my side the whole night? I said, don't leave my side. I said, because we're going to break up with the group, but I want you with me. By the time the night was over, do you remember what I'm talking about? We were here with a real pretty girl that we're going to get married. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. I remember that, yes. By the end of the night, and he said, and I, and I think you were there, but he goes, I will never doubt, you know, that there's ghosts again. Goes, right, absolutely. absolutely. I remember that. Blew my yes. mind. Absolutely. You know? And I got to say, I, I mean, I didn't set out to make him a believer, because I don't give a damn who believes or, or who doesn't. I, it's irrelevant to me. You know, if you, if you believe, you believe me, you don't, you don't. I, I couldn't care either way. Exactly. Yeah. And I yeah. Care. You know, I know what's true, you know, and it's up to you to make your own decisions. I don't push my beliefs on anybody I, I don't try and make anybody believers and stuff like that, especially with the psychic stuff. You know, if anybody, anybody tells me, oh, you're psychic, well, prove it. And you know what? Go to one of those five hour palm readers and let them go prove it to you. But I'm not surprised yeah, they'll, they'll prove it. Right? Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you you got a, you know, demon attached to you. And like Victor always says, give me $3,000, I'll make a wax figure and I'll get rid of the demon. Anyway, but um, yeah, but the whole skeptic thing, I think it's important. You know, I, I know we have a bunch of questions here, but I, I want to touch on this because this is really important. I think it's important to have a skeptic in every group, somebody who challenges you, because it's so easy for for investigators to get excited over things that might not be truly paranormal, like a picture, could be matrixing. You always have to have that skeptic to say, you know what, I'm not sure about this, and then discuss it. And I, what, what do you think about that? Absolutely. Uh, we, we have somebody like that, uh, the other team that I've affiliated with. And uh, they are like the, what do you call it, the tiller. The tiller on the back of the boat that keeps us sort of on the straight and narrow. Right. If somebody's going off in a tangent, they sort of bring us back to center. Uh, I do that also for certain, you know, for some teams. But um, I think what's really important to remember, and this is for anybody who's a member of a team or a young team or new guys who are doing new gal- gals who are doing it, or, or people who are thinking about getting involved in the paranormal. Uh, as Chris and I know, and as Jeff knows, and as I mentioned earlier, um, if we have 100 cases or 100 investigations in private homes I'm talking about now, 
I would say that 90 of them have absolutely nothing paranormal. What the people are experiencing is either something environmental or something emotional, uh, which, by the way, if it's environmental, you may be able to address it. If it's emotional, uh, unless you're a psychologist, you have no business addressing that. You, the best thing to do is, is just to say we, we can't find anything here um, and, and reassure them that there's nothing there that's harmful or, or, or to be afraid of. And, and if you can uh, politely uh, refer them to, uh, to uh, uh, someone who can uh, professionally help them. Um, only, only about you know, 10 cases, only about 10% of them actually have paranormal activity. So if you go into a house, do your due diligence, um, do your interview, do a pre-interview. We, we do a pre-interview before we ever go to anybody's house. And oh. a, lot of times, a lot of times the pre-interview solves everything because yeah. no matter talking to somebody for an hour on the phone, yeah. it's over, it's done. You know, just, that's the first part. The second thing is when you get there, do an interview, do a tour, um, as uh, Jeff said, he doesn't listen to that stuff because he wants to get his own feelings. Um, you want to do your measurements. If you have the uh, the instruments, do your measurements. But don't start finding things that don't exist because then you're doing exactly. service to the people that you're visiting. Don't do provocation. There's no reason to do a provocation ever anywhere for any reason. That's nonsense. That's that's TV theatrics, and it's disrespectful not only to the living but also the dead. You know what that? You know what that's like. That's like going into someone's living room, you open their door, you walk right in their living room, and you take their TV clip and you say, all right, I'm going to watch what I want now. So, I've got a question for you, a follow-up on that. How far do you think, now, you know I'm against provoking, I phone people off investigations because of provoke. How far do you think you can go? What is the limit before it becomes provoking? It depends on the spirit. It depends, you know, some spirits will joke with you and they, they like to joke around like that, you know, and you can tell their energy. Otherwise, you just don't do it. Yeah. I see, I, 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 I agree with that. I think the bottom line is you just don't do it. It has to be respect. You said something on the last show to enlighten me. I'm trying to think of what you said about provoking. Um, and then Victor and I both love what you said, and for the life of me, I can't remember. Well, it's the philosophy. It's the philosophy that you and I also maintain, that Jeff maintains, and that anyone who's a professional paranormal investigator maintains. If you're dealing with a disincarnate human being, you wouldn't say anything to the spirit that you wouldn't say to them if they were standing there in the flesh, right there and then. They're okay. still, they're still, they're still, they're still the uh, souls. They're still eternal beings, and and they yeah. deserve the same respect as the living do. They're still the same energy. They're still the same Absolutely. everything, except they're just not in human form anymore. So I mean, you don't know, just go into like uh, McDonald's and throw the guy in front of you out and say, "Okay, it's my turn now." You know? It's, Absolutely. Absolutely. And the standpoint, and and the thing about provoking, and I'll just I'll just gonna touch this and then I'm gonna let it go. Um, people see uh, shows like Zach Baggins and some of the Ghost Hunter shows, and they go in and they do provoking. So you're called to someone's home who believes that they have a spirit in the home. And you go in there, and you can't find anything. Do you provoke? Absolutely not, because there's nothing there to provoke. And by doing that, all you're doing is reinforcing the fear of the people who live in that house. And oh, yeah. you know, you're, you're in the wrong business. Get out of it. Yeah. You, you know, I want to I I touch on something in the chat room, and... Since the three of us are very similar, you know, being psychic, being empath, you know, mediums, we're all very similar. You know, we probably do things differently. We're, we're very similar in what we do. And Danielle in the chat room wants to know, she adjusted to me, but I'm going to adjust it to all of us. Other than yourself, with your abilities, what's the most important piece of equipment you can use during an investigation? And for me, other than myself, I would say it's the recorder. Well, what do you guys think? Yeah, recorder. Uh, for me, I'll tell you the truth. The recorder is great if there's actually something there that you can connect right. with. But for me, the EMF meter, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I've been, uh, for some reason, I get called in places that have really bad electrical wiring, maybe because I have a background in electricity. Uh, and the EMF meters are so valuable in terms of showing where you have bad electrical wiring, where you have bad grounds, and where you have free-floating electricity and free-floating magnetism. Yeah, it's a case like that. And, and what happens with that free-floating uh, energy is that it can create feelings of paranoia. It can create headaches. It can cause, uh, it can cause uh, uh, hallucinations, depending on how intense it is. And I've shared this story before. I'll share it one more time. I don't think I shared it with Jeff. 
uh, this uh, one other team that I'm affiliated with, we did an investigation in Brooklyn one time. This guy called up and said he was waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and there was a face staring right at his face, and he would scream, and it would go away. So we went there. Um, he sounded rational on the phone. We went there. First thing we noticed, there were half drunk wine bottles throughout the apartment, so the guy actually uh, enjoyed his, his, his uh, grape, grape juice. Um, but he had a iPod dock right next to his uh, headstand, his nightstand by his head. And uh, a normal device, for those who don't know about electromagnetic fields, normal appliance, grounded normal appliance, might put out somewhere between zero and one, one and a half uh, milligauss, which is a measurement of electromagnetic fields. Um, some appliances might put out two or three. This iPod dock pegged the meter at 100, couldn't go any higher. It was producing a tremendous magnetic field right next to this guy's head. So what was happening was creating this hallucination. It was creating this discomfort. It was creating all of the things that led to his waking up and thinking he saw a face. We took the iPod doc. We got it out of the room. We told him not to drink so much wine before going to sleep. <laughs> and that was the end of it. So there was no ghost there. That was that's, the end. That's, that's, that's like I was telling you about um, Salem. Salem has a ley line going right through the middle of it where all of the witch trials took place. And the electromagnetic field that is coming from the earth, I mean, it, it, you know, basically if 20% of those people were affected by that, that's enough to cause that hysteria. And they were so afraid when they came here anyway that, you know, it's basically, you know, if a few people are going to say, oh, no, the devil's here, and, and what do these people know? They, they are in a new land, they're in the woods, and they're afraid, and, you know, you're going to let your fear take over before anything else. Absolutely. So, I mean, that's basically enough to cause the hysteria here. And it's like that. I mean, have you guys ever come to Salem? It's, it's like it's got a different energy. It's beautiful up there. I love it up there, actually. Yeah. I've never been there. I'm dying to go. Uh, I'll, a good friend of ours, Tom Gillespie, lives up there. And I'm planning on going probably in March. Hopefully, we'll set up an investigation and, and go. Speaking yeah, of Tom Gillespie, my host. Jeff, okay. Jeff, speaking of our friend Tom Delosi, I just wanted to, Chris was uh, mentioning before, you were mentioning before, rather, about being online in the coffee shop when you get your coffee, and then somebody being very, uh, very uh, close to you, behind you, and you wanting to step forward. Well, our friend Tom likes to step backward in those situations, but we'll leave that for another time. <laughs> we'll, we'll leave that for another time. But before we leave that for another time, I just want to say, you're listening to Second Sight Radio, Psychic Medium, Chris George, Victor the Voice Foreman, our great guest, Jeff Legere on the DTM Wicked Radio Network and on PestleWolfMedia.com where you see our beautiful faces. Well, you speak to yourself with this mug. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, take it easy, Jeff. Anyway, we have a question. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question in the chat room from, uh, let me see, I think it's from Twitter, and I believe it's a she. Well, I don't know who, if it's a she or he, but they want to know about the obvious. What do you think about the obvious? And to me, I think it's a, it's a toy. I don't think it's anything. Yeah, it's the obvious toy. Is, um, it's basically it leads you into guessing into stories. Yeah, it's a joke. You hear the words and you say, "Oh, you hear barn," and you're like, "Oh, this used to be a barn. You died in the barn, or something." It, it just leads you into a story that is. I, I mean, I don't really like the obvious. It's Sorry. a joke, and you know what bothers me? It's expensive, and teens actually go out and buy this piece of crap, this toy that they're selling for so much money, and it's not, it doesn't do anything paranormal. It just yeah. sticks out words. It's let's, ridiculous. Let's, let's let's do a little definition for people who do not know uh, do not know what these devices are. So an obvious is a random word generator. It has a certain number of words programmed into it. Very random. And very random. And uh, what you do is you turn it on, and then you try to have a conversation with the spirit that may be present, and then sometimes it says absolutely nothing, and sometimes it spits out random words. But the bottom line is is that the spirit doesn't really generate the words that are coming out of it. So forget about that. The obvious is, is, a, is a toy. It's a lot of fun to play with, but it's a toy. It's not a serious instrument. You also have devices called ghost box or a prank box. This is a slightly different device. This is a device... If you ever took a radio and started tuning, turning the tuner on a radio, so you hear the channels rushing by, and once in a while you hear an intelligible word, that's like what the Frank Box or the Dust Box is. And there he is. He's showing this one right there. Which one is that, Jeff? 
It's the uh, SB7. SB7, which one? Is that the ghost box? Yep. Okay. And and again, it's it's random hits. And the idea, the theory behind it is that if there's a spirit present, they can actually project their voice or their words or their speech through these devices. And again, not my, not my cup of tea. You know, it's not my cup of tea either, Victor, but I'm going to say something. Um, we did uh, an investigation at the Chrysler Mansion, and there's a guy who lives there, okay? And this thing said his first and last name three times. And then it said Chrysler. That is clearly said Chrysler. And, you know, I don't like, I don't, I don't put a lot of, um, I don't put a lot into the ghost box, but I got to say, I have been part of a few sessions that kind of, you know, made me think, wow, you know, this, this could be something because it was, it was too spot on. How do you get, how, I mean, Chrysia, Chrysia is a, a, a hard word to come up with on any piece of equipment. Yeah, we had one. Uh, I agree that, you know, a lot of the stuff is just kind of like chattering, and, but is the second and the third voice below that they actually, those, those are the ones to listen to. I mean, we had one that really stands out in my mind. I was over there at the mansion, and we were, uh, it was my brother, my niece, and a bunch of other people, and we were doing an investigation. And my niece kept putting everything on Facebook, like, oh, put that on Facebook, put that on Facebook. So we're upstairs, and we said, so how can we uh, communicate with you? And he said, Facebook. You know, wow. Wow, you know, I mean, so it was listening to us, but it, it's like, you know, they're, they're far and few between. Half the stuff you get on the go process is this junk. I'm, I'm, okay. not, I'm not completely dismissing them. I think EVP sessions with a recorder are much more valuable. Yeah, because cool. there, there, there's nothing, there's no chance of, oh, there's a, a, a phenomenon called matrixing. What does matrixing mean? Matrixing means that your mind will try to define something that it sees, hears, or feels within the context of what you know. So, for example, uh, people look at a picture and they see a face. Even though there's no face there, their mind has enough elements that they think they see two eyes and nose and a mouth or, or something of that nature. And yeah. the concept of matrix in your brain puts that together and says, oh, there's a face there, whether yeah. there's a face there or not. Same thing with sound. You can have audio matrixing where a certain number of sounds come out of a radio or a device or something like that, and your mind will organize them into something it can define and, and listen to and hear. Or so that's somebody where, says it, or if somebody says that phrase, that's right. the phrase that's in your mind. So you that's to right. And you're right. Good. Exactly. So you're sort of that's pre-programmed it. to hear that. You guys, yeah. you guys know um, Stephen uh, Riley Black? I, uh, I, I'm friends with him. He's, he's married to... Um, Riley. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I know, I know exactly. Who you it was for my last uh, the uh, investigation that I had, and um, we were upstairs, and she got like a ton of EVPs, just like straight. And I mean, they were they were like really good. She got like a little girl. She got she she's been sending them to me, and it's like some of the stuff. And I agree, straight EVPs are the best. You know, I mean. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that's why I, I believe that that's the best piece of equipment you can do uh, besides yourself. Absolutely. So, you know, speaking of investigations, you live in a haunted house. Can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> <laughs> I must be psychic because I just thought of that. I that too, man. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, you know what? Last night, um, Every now and then I hear, I mean, I live in a city. you got to remember that. And where I am, it is slightly wooded. But last night at about probably like 9 o'clock, I mean, I heard the coyotes again. I heard just this, there is this howling that is not a coyote. I don't know what it is. I mean, and, you know, everything paranormal, paranormal is something you can't explain. This is, I mean, it, it sounds like a wolf. So I heard that last night, and then I come home today, and all the trees got cut down, like that were coming up the pathway. To, and it's like all the trees were cut down and gone. They were grinding them up as I showed up after work. And I'm like, whoa. So I came in here. This place is buzzing. I mean, it's been quiet for the last, like, week or so. There's been nothing going on tonight. There's, like, all kinds of activity. They all came in here. I don't know how many were in here right now. 
it's uh I'm gonna have to set down the rules after before I go to bed because it it just gets stirred up all kinds of stuff. But I mean, it, it makes you wonder: Do the spirits know before these things are gonna happen? You know, it's. I mean, I, I swear to God, it's like when you're in front. I, I think so. He'll I visit agree. you a couple of nights before. You know, I've had that happen. That you know, I get visited, or when I'm on my way there, you know, all of a sudden my GPS will go bad, and I'll end up some place that isn't even close to where I'm supposed to be. Or it's, but I mean, last night it just activity just burst outside, and it's, I didn't even know about this tree thing. And I came home, and all the trees were cut down. I'm like, oh, this isn't good. They're blasting rocks on the other side, releasing all the granite energy. And then they're, now they're cutting down the trees that are around here. So, I mean, it just it boosted it up. I mean, right, right now there's, like, flashes and all kinds of crazy stuff going on in here. I don't, I'm not even connecting with it now because I'm talking to you guys. But it, it makes you want I mean, it's, I mean, I definitely think that they know before something is going to happen that, it, you know, and then it just happens. Yeah, you know, I've, I've got some houses where, um, as I'm walking in, the person who lives there says, they must know you're coming because the activity's been crazy. Yeah. And, and, and I get that all the time. I mean, we both do this, right? I mean, we can all the time. Oh, my God, I can't believe, you know, what's been going on in this house the last two hours, you know? Um, it, it, that's typical. I think that's very typical, actually. Yeah, because it's, it's definitely what happened here. Because it's, I was just thinking, you know, because I knew I was going to be on this show, and I really, I, I was thinking, well, I really get nothing to to talk about ghost wise because it's been quiet here, you know. It's, it's, um, there was four here, you know, after the party, the only ones that stayed, I have them, my cleaning lady that stayed, and, and there's, there's this other guy, he's a, um, I think he was like a coordinator for the grounds. He was like uh, in charge of, you know, running maintenance and keeping everything in order. And then the other two, I had like a, just a regular worker, and there was a little girl that they passed on after the party. So the, the other two stayed. They won't go. They'll just stay here. I, I like them though, because my cleaning lady. Because oh, when it's crappy out, I smoke cigars in the bathroom, and I wake up in the morning and smell like lavender. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm keeping her, and she keeps me at it clean. You know, she, she just, you know, she bitches at me all the time, but like she still at me. <laughs> Do you ever yeah, have a cat and a wife? <laughs> do you ever have spirits follow you home and stay there? Uh, no, I think that my energy, I, I am kind of like um, a beacon where they come to me for help when they need help. But um, I don't know. Maybe they do follow me home. I'm not sure. But I, I really don't have a passion. Now, how far are you from Salem? You get to him? Yes. Oh, okay. I went. Uh, I got uh, frozen for a second. Um, I, I personally think that, um, especially for psychics and psychic mediums, uh, you should never be followed home. Uh, I, I think, yeah. you know, if you're doing things the right way, then first of all, there's no reason for them to follow you home. Number one. Number two, uh, they can't attach to you if you're doing what you're supposed to do, clearing yourself before and after. You know. It, there are things you got to do to, to protect yourself. I, I didn't mean follow you home in the sense of attachment. I mean, you and I and Jeff are beacons. Spirits see us. They know that we right. can see them and feel them and hear them and interact with them. So if the spirit is lost and they see the beacon in the light, it's like flies coming to a light in the middle of the night. Yeah. You know, Understood. Would they possibly follow us home? And the answer is yes. I've had spirits follow me. Yeah, I, I, I say right. yes. Yeah, because... Yeah. Uh, it's like I, I I put a post on my Facebook a couple of months ago. It, it's like it seems every house I work in is haunted, and it's you know it's basically because they come to me from that area. There you go. So I yeah, refer, I refer to it as being an energy beacon. You're an energy beacon basically, and they they they, they see your energy, they acknowledge it, they know that you can acknowledge them and they follow. Yeah, but I mean it's I from what I'm doing with my life coaching and everything, and um, you know my law of attraction, I. I keep a pretty high vibration. Right. You know, I, I mean, I notice it when it drops, and I, I pick it up right away. But I think that, you know, these people that get attachments, they're, they're, they're operating on a low vibration, so that's what they're, they're attaching to them. Absolutely. I agree with I have an interesting question, and really this isn't a part of you because you don't, you don't really drink. Um, so, Jeff, 
you ever notice that um, when you have a few drinks and you're hanging out, and you're not investigating, you're just hanging out with your friends, your family, whatever, having a good time at a party, and you have a few drinks, you know that the spirit comes to you more? Yes. It's amazing, isn't it? Yes. I, I, now, I, I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because, you know, our resistance is a little lower. Maybe we're more open. Maybe I, I don't know what the reason for that is. Maybe you guys can answer that. But I find that when I'm hanging out with friends and having a few drinks, like on New Year's Eve, I, I know what's going to happen. It doesn't happen all the time. I'll have a few drinks, and, and you'll see I'll be talking to somebody, and my eyes will wander up to the left, or they'll wander up to the right, because the spirits are trying to get my attention, trying to talk to me. And yeah. And it's very, very common for me if I'm hanging out with friends and like stuff like that happens. So maybe you guys could uh, follow up on that. Jeff, what do you it think? Happened on, it happened to me on 4th of July because it was uh, pouring out here. And so everything got canceled. So I had a few people, like my brother came over, a couple of other people that I know, just like four of us, we came over here and we were doing like a little investigating. And... Right after that, I had this, this really aggressive spirit. It's like the only one I really had in here. And that's where it came from because I was drinking that night and whatever, doing other, you know. So he showed up and it's, it's like, really? You snuck in through the door, didn't you? So, I mean, I had to, it took like a day or two to get rid of him, Bill, because he was, he was pretty strong. But it's like, yeah, when you're drinking, I mean, a lot of times, it's uh, feeling the energy of, like, going into bars and stuff, too. It, it doesn't really feel too good. You know? My that take is, on that... I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Jeff. I thought you were done. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm done. Um, my take on that, Chris, is that when you drink, um, you're depressing your central nervous system and, in essence, relaxing yourself. Mm -hmm. And perhaps you're more relaxed, and that way you're more open, not to advocate that drinking is good to become a psychic, but that it, the fact that you're, 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 you know, it's like meditating, the same thing. It puts you into that more relaxed condition where you're, you're more open and available to that type of energy and information. Mm -hmm. I, I got something to do with you. Now, Victor, you've been to my seances uh, at least once, maybe twice, okay? Um, I'm a big believer you don't drink when you do it type of stuff, okay? You, you know, you just don't do it. I find it to be just stuck with the spirit, my own personal opinion. Um, but that being said, when I've done seances uh, and I'm telling the spirit that might like to drink a little scotch or a little wine, what will happen is, and I don't even realize I'm doing it because I'm in trance, I'll take a glass of, of scotch or a shot or whatever, and I'll drink it. And the funny thing is, so that's a lot of seance. Now, Victor, you've been witness to this. Um, I'm straight as an arrow. It doesn't matter if I have one shot or five shots. I'm straight as an arrow. But once they come out of trance and the seance is over an hour, two hours later, whatever it is, then I'm all tipsy. I have no idea how to explain that. No idea. Maybe you guys have an idea. Jeff? Yeah, maybe they get their energy through you. They say, oh, thank God, I've been dying for a drink. I'll, I'll get it through it. I'll tell you what they said to us, because people have asked, you know, spirits through me, um, can you taste it? And they say, no, it's a memory. It's a memory. I don't, they don't taste it at all, but it's a memory. And that's why they do it, which I find to be very interesting. Yeah, but, but, the most but for you, they're getting the physical, they're getting the physical part of it, too, you know? They're, 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 yeah. You know, they're, they're going with the memory and they're adding the physical there. You know, it's, it's a sense that they don't have anymore. So they're using that sense through you, and they're like, thanks that you showed up. Yeah, it, 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 it boggles me every time because I, I come out, and I'm all tipsy, and I'm like, was I like this during the fans? I'm like, no, you were perfectly fine. You were not swearing. You were speaking perfectly. However, the spirit was speaking. But then I come out of the trance, and I'm like, well, you know, I'm a little bit tipsy. It's, it, it, it just it boggles me every single time. Well, let, let's take it to something else, and I'm, I'm, I'm not being funny about this. I'm being serious about this. What about sex? Who spirits enjoy sex through us? Well, but there is no, no. I'm serious. No, I'm serious about this. I'm, I'm serious. Yeah, I'm, I'm serious too. Um, I, <laughs> you know, I can't answer that question. I'm not going to answer that. But no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not trying to set you up. I'm, I'm looking for. No, no. I, I know. I do have a story, but I'm not going to share it. But I do have another story. I, I have a friend. She's a very good friend of mine. And Victor, you met her last year at. at uh, at the uh, New Year's Eve party. Lisa. Okay. Did you have to say her name? 
I didn't say her last name. I didn't say her last name. Anyway, she's been having sex with a spirit for years and years and years. And and says that the only time she has ever reached, you know, that cli- that climax is with the spirit. Never with a human. Is wow. that crazy? And I'm gonna tell you something, Jeff, Jeff, this is a true story. I have the videotape. Yep. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute now, now, wait a minute. No, 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 I'm going to listen. It didn't get bad. I didn't let it get bad. What happened was it was me and my sister, who, who you'll meet, I think you met my sister with the twin couplet. Yes. Um, she was there with me, her, my brother-in-law, and and I, I don't know, maybe my nephew. And I'm at her house, and we're videotaping her, and she's wearing, um, you know, uh, uh, whatever she was wearing. Anyway, we actually saw it start to light up a body. And then we actually see, and she says she'll come on the show and talk about this, but it's not like I'm talking behind the back and I would never do that. And we actually saw her breath moving, like it was being fondled and then caressed. And she started moaning. And we all looked at each other like, oh, my God, this is really happening. And, and you know, I had to stop it, and I woke her up, and she, and she, you know what? She just wanted to stop it. I was having a good time. True story. In fact, I actually write about it in my book. Well, she, so, said, she said she can only come to orgasm with a relationship with the spirit, right? Yeah. The spirit must be using Viag ghost. <laughs> Whatever he's using, it's working. There you go. Oh, my God. But that's, that's, that's a true story. True story. And, and like I said, she said she would actually come on the show and talk about it, which we should probably do one day. Absolutely. I think that would be a fascinating story. I think that would be a good show. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you don't know much for me, so you know, she's like the female version of me. She's crazy, and she's a lot of fun, and she's a good person, and she can tell a story. So, um, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm going to talk to her and, and see if she'll come on when we play. That's quite a story to tell. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And when you hear from her, it's, it's even better. Yeah, Jeff, you want to take the next question? So, Jeff, um, you've had near-death experiences. Uh, how did they lead you to believe uh, in uh, the afterlife and things that we can't see? You know, it's funny. It's like us three when we get together. It's like we're at a picnic talk, and we never even get to my question. <laughs> I know. I know. It's funny, right? That's how we're so alike. All right. Um, their death experiences. I actually had, I only talked about one and the other one, but I've actually had three right. that they happened within like a year. And um, the first one that happened is like I was telling you guys in the last show is I was scuba diving with another guy that, you know, he was like Mr. Frickin' Nature guy and all this stuff. So I had to like try to keep up with him. And I ran out of air because we were going for losses, which I probably got two in like five years of diving. But anyway, so I ran out of air. So we went down. As we were going down, it was just kind of raining out, and we came up. It was like a full-blown thunder and lightning storm. So we kind of got separated. He got washed up on the beach on the other side, and I got I went in to this area that was all rock. So the waves were kind of throwing me into the rocks, and they were crashing me and just pulling me back out. I mean, I was exhausted. I had no breath or anything left in me. So the last time I went crashing into the rock and there was a man standing on the rock that grabbed me by the hand and he pulled me up out of the ocean and and so I went and I took my mask off and he was gone. I mean it's as I swear that was my angel that saved me that Wow. And I mean, like I was telling you guys last time where he was standing, there nobody could stand. I had to crawl up it was all moss. I couldn't even stand up at that point, so I got about 10 feet past it. And, and then I turned around, and he was gone. So that was the first one. So, I mean, I think all three of them had a different meaning for me. And it was like, Chris, when we were talking about how, you know, you met that woman, you know, the old woman. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. You know, in, it's like you had no idea where she came from. And then you had this other situation where you were there at the, the, the same exact time to help that girl at the hospital. You know? right. Like, I mean, everything that was happening around there, I mean, that was that was a sign to you that you should be continuing with what you're doing. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. I, I totally think that that's what happened to you. 
So and then, all right, so my second one, um, I woke up one morning, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to go hike up Mount Lafayette. And so I went up there, and it's just up in New Hampshire, it's about a two-and-a-half hour drive from where I live. So I'm, I went up there, and it was kind of like a, a little snowy, little little crappy out. And so I'm driving up there, it's the same thing as I'm going up. And, I mean, I get to the top, and it's like a full-blown blizzard. So I'm just uh, going up, and I'm like, well, you know what? I'm just fire. I'm like, I'm just going to keep on going. I had my two pieces of chicken and water, and that was it. So as I go up, there's these ten guys that were huddled over by a rock. And I this guy went up there, and I'm like, oh, yeah, they sent me up here to save you guys. <laughs> And they're like, oh, my God, thank you, thank you. We didn't know what we'd do. They need, like, these, full, these 10 accountants from, like, uh, Connecticut or something. I don't know what they were. That's wild. So, I mean, I, I was kind of their guardian on that one. But and it's when we, we ended up going, I'm like, well, you know what? We can miss fire. I'm going to the ridge. So I brought him with me up to the ridge and over. So we went to the top, and then I brought him down to the tree line. But, I mean, it's. The, the fact that I got up that morning and I'm just like, you know what, I'm going to go hiking today. It's like, you know, I, and I just drove up there and it, it's like I went there to, to meet them, to save them. So, I mean, that's two different scenarios. I was saved by an angel and then I actually became the savior of another person. Then the third one was, I think it was testing my metal on this one. I was working out at the Y, and it was, it was a Tuesday night. I remember this exactly. It was a Tuesday night. It was about 7.30, 8 o'clock, and I was leaving, and the guy that used to work out there all the time, he used to drink and stuff and then go work out, but I didn't, you know, whatever. We didn't know all these crazy people at the Y anyway. He goes, hey, Jeff, can you give me a ride home? It was raining. So I'm like, yeah, all right, come on. So because he lives in Peely. So we get in the car, I'm driving home, like, oh, I'm going to kill my wife, and like this, and that. I'm going to kill my wife. I'm like, okay, we live. Let me just drop you off, and you can do what you want from there. He goes, oh, hey, could you wait a minute? I'm going to um go down the bar down the street. I'm going to go grab some money from my house. I'm like, yeah, sure. That's fine. So he comes back out. He has a gun with him. So he goes, that's it. I'm going to kill my wife. And I'm like, no, you don't want to do that. It's like you, one moment, and you're going to spend the rest of your life in jail. You really want that? So I'm kind of like, I talked him out of it. And he goes, you're right, Jeff, you're right. And so he said, that's it. I'll kill myself instead. And he puts a bullet into the chamber. He spins the chamber, puts it to his head. Mind you, he's in the passenger seat. I'm in the seat, in the driver's seat. It would have went through him and through me at the same time. Oof. He pulled the trigger, and then I still get chills thinking of this. He pulls the trigger, and he goes, he clicks, and he opens it up, and he goes, oh, look, it was the next one. And I'm like, oh, oh my God. I said, Bill, where are you going right now? <laughs> and he just dropped you off. So I dropped him off the bar. And the last thing he told me, he goes, you ever tell anyone about this? I'll kill you. And I'm like, all right, man, don't worry. But I stayed calm, cool, collected. I talked him out of what he was going to do. And from there on in, I had no idea what ever happened to him. But, I mean, that, this, this all happened within, like, three probably three or four months of all three of these things. So it kind of gave me a new perspective on, you know, what I should be doing and, you know, that there is other things out there other than, you know, basic life itself. You know, I mean, so, I mean, it, it, it was three different scenarios where I was a different person in all three of them. Interesting. It just kind of like it was the beginning of my path, which I mean, I'll admit I forgot about that path for a good 10 to 15 to 20 years until I started doing what I'm doing now. 
hold that thought because mm-hmm. that's something very interesting. We're going to start our second hour because we've come up to the end of a very fast first hour. And our wonderful guest is Jeff Legere. Uh, he's psychic medium Chris George. I'm Victor the Voice Herman. You're listening to Second Sight Radio on the DTM Wicked Paranormal Radio, uh, DTMWicked.com. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> DTM I'm tired, guys. I've been traveling for four days. DTMWicked.com and also TeslaWolfMedia.com. And we will be back. Hey, everybody. Come check out my new book, Billy's Rabbit Saves Christmas, written by me, Dennis Gager. Um, this book will debut number one on Amazon for hot new children's book releases, release, and it has been nominated for two awards, the Beehive, uh, Award, sorry, Beehive Book Award for Children Literature, and I just found out I was nominated for the Children's Crown Award. I'm very excited. Please stop by and check out my book on Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. And once again, it's called Billy Rabbit Saves Christmas. It's a great holiday read for children five and under, and it's it's just a way for parents and children can bond together. Check it out today.
monkey face Sprinting in forever kind of race Miss like losing before you can To finish Where you can only close your eyes And maybe wish You can get there before you become One of the restless that gives in Demons, reincarnation, past lives, the afterlife, divination, exorcisms, witchcraft, the unseen. He's psychic medium Chris George, and he's Victor the Voice Fireman. We are Second, Second Sight, Sight Radio. I'm psychic medium Chris George, and I'm joined by the Velvet Teddy Bear, the Victor, the Voice Farman, and we've been interviewing Jeff Legere the first hour, and he's coming back for the second hour. Um, I think the first hour was fantastic, if I do say so myself. And uh, again, we want to thank Jeff for being our guest tonight. Um, you're very welcome, man. Uh, okay, just a second sight. Um, all right, Victor, I'm not going to mention no names because you know when we when we came to DPM. Uh, and, and Tesla, you said to me, Chris, let's let's be nicer. Let's not call people out and you know use their names and whatnot. Although I do slip every now and then, but I'm uh, I'm cussed of it tonight, so I'm not going to say the name. Um, I get I get an inbox from somebody who really isn't a friend of mine. We're not even friends on Facebook, but this this girl is on Facebook. Sends me an inbox and says, Chris, so and so, who is a psychic that I know that that you know of, Victor, uh, out of nowhere, in Boston Park, and says, for the ne- I got a vision for the next two weeks, you can't leave your house because you think you're going to die. <laughs> and if you uh, pay me $160 for a half hour reading, I'll tell you what you can do so you don't die. And this girl calls me, and she's, you know, she, I tell her, call me. So she calls me, and she's in a panic. Um, first thing she said to me, she said, well, are you going to charge me $160? I said, I'm not going to charge you anything because I'm just going to talk to you. Um, so a psychic, now we talk about psych- ethics of a psychic, a psychic medium. We've done it many times. Ethically, it is a horrible thing to do. First of all, she didn't reach out to him. He reaches out to her and tells us, if you leave your house, you're going to die. Putting the fear of God into this poor girl, okay? Who, by the way, is not the most stable of people to begin with, okay? So now this girl is going out of her mind. She reaches out to me. Somebody she hasn't spoken to in three years, by the way, um, and says, I know you're the, one, you're the only person who's going to tell me the truth. I said, you're not going to die. And what the person did was set you up so he can make some money on you. Um, that really, really twisted my onion. Because here's a guy who, in my opinion, and again, this is just my opinion, is not psychic, um, uh, reaching, going out of his way to tell somebody you're going to die, okay? In two weeks, you're dead if you leave the house. And that's how he said it. You're dead. Your family, okay, your family is going to be um, visiting you at your funeral, you know, I see hundreds of people coming to your funeral. How dare you? I mean, how dare anybody do that? Um, I, I would love to hear your opinion on this. I mean, just me. I, I mean, this is to me, he's a piece of shit, absolute piece of shit. What do you? Yeah. What's, I'm gonna ask you here's, here's my first question because I don't know who we're talking about. You'll tell me off air. You'll tell me offline who we're talking about. Um, is it possible that somebody hacked his account and did this? No. You want to know why? Because I asked her, I said, um, did you, you spoke to him on the phone? And she said, yes. 
I said, what's his phone number? She gave me his phone number, and I said, okay, it's him. Because I thought the same thing. Okay. Yes, it absolutely was this guy reaching out there telling the other this a of crap. Because I once was hacked on Facebook about four years ago, and somebody reached out to all my friends trying to sell something to them, and they knew obviously right. it wasn't me. So I just want to make sure that this was okay. So we'll discuss this later. Well, that's disgusting, first of all. Um, if this is a person you had any respect for before, there's no respect left now, obviously. Right. Uh, and and quite frankly, if it's somebody that we both know, I think we should have a conversation with this person and straighten them out. Um, well, first, first of all, um, this, this person won't ever speak to me. I've already trashed him. I mean, I mean, I severely trashed him. He was supposed to come on my television show when I had my television show years back. And, and the day of the show, he... Um, <laughs> He sick me the day of the show. And then he was supposed to come on set and say, I said, you know what? Let me give this more on another chance. And um, again, uh, an hour before the show starts, he calls me like, oh, Chris, I can't make it. Actually, he didn't tell me. His boyfriend told me. He says, oh, Chris, um, he can't make it tonight. I'm like, are you kidding me? And half, uh, an hour before my show, you're going to do this to me? So uh, ethically, the guy, he, he has none. Okay? Whether it's I think or, or just human. The guy is an absolute piece of crap. And and, and to do this is just oh my god, it just it, it eats at me to know that that this son of a bitch is getting a hundred and fifty dollars a half an hour for a reading that as in my opinion sucks, okay, isn't even real, and and he's doing this, he's calling people without them coming to him and telling him, Oh, by the way, you're gonna die. Really? Well, Chris, you know, I want to get Jeff's input on that. But number one, um, if, if he's doing something like that, then this guy's doing something criminal because basically what he's doing is he's intimidating and extorting money out, out of people, unsuspecting people, and that's that's just totally criminal. Here, Absolutely. Here, here. Oh, Jeff, why don't you put your two cents in? Go ahead. Well, first of all, I mean, it's these people that they live or die by what a psychic says. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a big right. people. Absolutely. And it, it's like, you know, what happens is, you know, I mean, like, you know, my big thing now is my belief and that will become their belief. I mean, I don't know if her belief will get strong enough that she'll actually die in two weeks, but these people have this belief that, oh my God, he's telling me this and that. I have to right. do that or that. It's like, you know, you, you give up your free will to this place. I had an ex girlfriend that, you know, we, we still talk, every, you know, every now and then, and she's telling me about this other guy that he's supposedly this psychic and he knows everything, and she goes, oh, look, um, she, you know, she showed me a picture of her and her ex-husband that was, like, way back in her Facebook, back from, like, 2010, and he pulled it up, and he goes, oh, is that Jeff? And she goes, how did she know that? I'm like, because he's freaking profiling me. You can't figure that out? And she's like, no, he's really real. He's real. I'm yeah. like, what, Ella? And I mean, that was like, I mean, the guy, I mean, he profiled through their whole Facebook, you know, timeline. And he comes up with all this stuff. He goes, oh, you're a cabinet that are old and this and that. And he goes, oh, yes. And so these people start believing these people because they're coming up with general facts about them that they're. You know, and it's ridiculous. And I'm like, you can't see what he's doing. And she goes, no, no, he's real. And I'm like, whatever, you go with whatever you think is right, you know. But it's like the same thing that just happened to you. This girl, I mean, she just, her beliefs were so strong that this guy was real and he was telling her what he needed. It. It's basically a charlatism, you know. It's, it's all Absolutely. The, the oldest psychic scam in the book. Is you go into the sidewalk psychic and you sit down, they do the cold read on you, and then they tell you you have a curse on your family. And what you right. have to do is meet them at midnight in the graveyard, bring two hard boiled eggs, uh, a couple of leaves of lettuce, and $916.82 because it's some weird number. It's always a, it's an oddball number. It's not like $1,000 because there's a spiritual significance to $916.82. Yeah. And if you meet them, They'll take the curse off. And they play, they do a sleight of hand and do magic tricks and open up the egg and there's a blood spot and say, see, I've cleared the curse. And it's a charlatan's game. Okay. So psychic phenomena, just like any other commodity, let the buyer beware. Know who you're dealing with. And if anybody comes up to you and says, you're going to die unless you give them money, call the cops. Don't call anybody else. Just call the cops.
Yeah, you know, I found it interesting, and I, I said to the girls, you know, we haven't really spoken in three years. And interestingly enough, um, I used to, I used to, uh, I used to read this girl. I used to teach. I used to do private lessons with her, and um, she stopped doing private lessons with me because this other psychic told her he's a better psychic than me. Okay, what I heard was not. He's not even psychic. That's neither here nor there. Um, he, he said some things about me, you know, all over Staten Island or whatever. And and she went and actually started studying with this guy at, at his place. Okay, he has a, a place here in Staten Island. And um, so but I guess they had a falling out and they didn't see for a while. Then he calls her out of nowhere and tells her you got this, you know, you're gonna die. And then lo and behold, she's calling me. You know, three years ago, I wasn't you know good enough for her. But here it is three years later. And, and I am. And, you know, it, it's funny because I laugh about it because I, I tell this to people all the time. You know, people, I run into people and they're like, you know what, well, I, I don't believe in psychics. And, you know, I never try, like I said earlier, I never try and convince them. What I always tell them is, you don't have to believe. You know, that's your prerogative. That you, you know, you don't have to believe in me. I'm not telling you, you that you do. But if down the line something goes wrong and you need help and you have nowhere else to turn, Remember second meeting with Chris Jordan. You know why? Because whether you believe me or not three years ago, I'll be here and I'll help you. And if by helping you, you become a believer, hey, that's phenomenal. That's great. But I, I will be here. I'm not going to turn you away because, you know, two or three years ago you told me you didn't believe. You know, I always tell them, if you have the way off the turn, give me a call. Maybe I can help. And, and you know, to see somebody do what he did, it, just, it really irks me. It irks me. But, uh, it kind of, um, kind of brings up a point, though, that I just kind of thought up. Do we, like, you know, people like us have the advantage because we can kind of feel when someone has that ability, whereas other people maybe can't, and they, they just have to trust their instinct. But, I mean, I know when people are fake right away. Oh, I mean, you yeah. guys do, too. Uh -oh. Well, you know, some people are better at hiding it. The thing is, I know one psychic, uh, again, I won't, won't mention his name. I've done a, a, a bunch of big events with him, actually, okay? And, and uh, I've said it many times, I don't believe he's a real psychic. I believe he's very empathic. I believe he's very intuitive. But I don't think he gets messages from spirit, okay? Um, he, he puts on a great show. You know, he comes in with, with you know, silk and, and yeah, he yeah. kind of prances and, and he does, you know, he stages people and he goes, you know, blow the water in, on him, you know, in between reading. And people are like, wow, this guy's really cool. I want to show you, you'll see the real deal. Meanwhile, he doesn't tell them anything. He yeah. tells them nothing. He wastes, you know, three or four minutes of their reading doing his whole act. And then when he starts reading them, he tells them nothing. He starts telling them about Mother Earth and, and Gaia and the universe is working for you and tells them absolutely nothing. And they walk away like, oh, my God, that was great. Uh, and, I, and it blows my mind because, yes, I'm psychic. It's New Age Babble. That's all it is. Yeah. Well, you know what? I love that. New Age Babble. Long way. There's, there's some hypnotism involved in that, too, that it's like he's building up an expectancy in these people. So it's, you know, in order to follow the crowd. I mean, that's how a lot of hypnotists work, too, Absolutely. is they'll pull someone up on stage, and because of our own um, reaction where we want to fit in with the crowd, a lot of people will just get hypnotized just for that that reason. And, you know, he's pulling people in that, you know, he, he puts on the show and he, he uh, brands himself. He brands himself as the hypnotist, you know, because he wears the outfit and everything. And then he talks about the universe and the stars and all that crap. So people think that, oh, well, what he's saying, it must be real. Look at how he's dressed. You know, that's not right. the way the mind thinks. Yeah. My favorite, my favorite phony psychic is the one who does the cold read, and then comes up with some absolute garbage. And the person says, "says Does that make sense to you what I just said?" And they said, "No, it doesn't make sense." Well, it will soon. You don't know it right now, but it will soon. So they're yeah. forcing this idea. They're making the person feel belittled because they don't recognize what the psychic's talking about. That's yeah. a common trick in, in cold reading, and it's something that people should be aware of. Oh yeah, I mean, if, if you're going to talk to a psychic. He talk about something. Day. We, me and my brother had this guy on the show that um, I can't remember his name, John something. But I mean, this guy was like really spot on. And he's talking about uh, I was living over in 
he had a set at Beverly at the time, and I had three spirits with me there. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you have three spirits, yeah, man, woman, this and that. Stuff that anybody could say. But then at the end, he goes to me, he goes, and you got to fix that broken window, too. And it's like right before I went to my brother's house to do the show, I was looking at the window on the porch, you know, because I was ready to sell the house. And I'm like, oh, that's another thing I do is fix that window. And I just, nobody knew this but me. Right. So, and I went, and he goes, and he told me that. And then for my brother, he, he had spirits at his house, too. And he goes, yeah, yeah, there's the one saw on the stairs, this and that. And he goes, you have a skeleton key hanging on the door downstairs that you don't know what it goes to. And my brother's like, whoa, no way. And he showed me the key that's on his door. And this guy was in Maryland, and we are you know, on the phone with him. Nobody knew these two things, but, I mean, right there, that's, to me, it's well, Jeff, Jeff, he actually he was calling from Maryland cell phone. No, Maryland cell phone number. He broke your window and he looked in your brother's house before. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so that's Christmas at Church of Second Sight. I got a little baby Church of Second Sight. And it's really so. It, 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 the more I think about it, the more petty it sounds to myself. But I just want to get it off my chest. I was down in Florida the last couple of days on a business trip. I came back this afternoon. Uh, Jeff Blue uh, had uh, a seat. And there was nobody next to me. I had two seats right to my right, and I figured out I got the whole row. And I was actually thinking about taking my carry-on laptop bag and putting it between the two center seats so that I had the full room in front of me, a lot of room to be comfortable, and so on and so forth. And uh, just as they're closing up the plane, this guy comes running on late. He's put into the third seat against the wall, against the window, rather. I'm on the aisle seat. And I said, oh, okay, hi. I got up. I let the guy in. I'm very courteous and polite on planes. And in life, I'm courteous. I'm, I'm that kind of person. I just like to be courteous and polite because I, I'd like to get it back to myself. And the guy gets on there, and he takes his laptop bag and puts it in the middle seat, underneath the middle seat, where I was going to put mine but didn't do it. And he puts it under the middle seat. So now the first thing he's done is he's taken away that space from both of us. Okay, or from, He took it for himself. The next thing he does is he turns on the TV screen in the middle seat and turns with his whole body. So now he's between the first the window seat and the middle seat. He's taking up two seats and, re- and watching the TV with his bag underneath there. And in the seat next to me, he puts all his, like, personal stuff. So this guy helped himself to the two seats. You know, we could have easily shared the space together. But this guy took two seats. He came in with a sense of entitlement. He was entitled to do whatever he wanted to do. And I just – that drives me nuts. When people act like that, arrogant and entitled – and I didn't say anything. You know, it wasn't a big deal. It was a two-hour, two-and-hour, and 20-minute flight. I didn't care. Now, Victor, yep. what were your vibrations that you attracted that guy there? That's a good question. I, I was tired, and I think I needed to be more alert, and I think that's probably the reason I attracted him there. It's not like uh, – yeah, it wasn't. I wasn't putting out a vibe that I needed a lesson of any kind or a test of patience because I have a lot of patience, really. But it just, it just sort of struck me as, as really, really arrogant that he would do something like that. You know, I'm trying to be courteous to everyone else, and this guy is Mr. Discourtesy, and he doesn't care about anybody else. And, it's all you know, situations in neutral. What what yeah. attracted that guy to to take all that stuff that you wanted to do? I don't know. What what was it? You tell me, Jeff. I don't know. I'm asking you. I'll tell you what it was. He was just a rude asshole and rude people suck. That's it. No, yeah. no, no, no. I understand Jeff's point. Jeff's point is sometimes we attract things into our lives to, to right. reflect something or give us a lesson, you know. And in this case, I, I think the lesson was is that just maybe, uh, maybe, maybe in a way, I was, I'd say, you know what? Sometimes I'd like to be like that guy. But maybe well, I want to put my bed there and stretch out and, you know, right. take, take the two seats. But it just seems to be a reflection maybe of the relationships that I've had in my life with the people who've taken advantage of me. And maybe that's what it's about. Maybe on, on a long term, that's what that's about. Good thing, good thing. What do you think, Jeff? Is that sound starting to sound yeah. uh, Maybe. Yeah, it's starting to resonate a little bit. Jeff, you and I will do a psychological session. I'll, I'll hire you as a coach. We'll, we'll, work, we'll work this through. <laughs> <laughs> but Eddie, but I, I just I just wanted to point out that hey, you know, when you're in an airplane, and uh, and an airplane is crowded and there's not a lot of space, be courteous to other people, be kind, be be respectful and aware of their space. And as people who we are, psychic and empathic, we're very sensitive about energy in our space. Oh, yeah. And I think maybe that's what this was. Also, this was an intrusion of my energy. Yeah, I, see me. I'm a little bit different than you, Victor, because I've been in a situation like that before where you know. 
the three of us in the seat, and, and the guy is taking the armrest and completely taking the whole thing, and, and I'm sitting like this, and I'm a big guy, and I tell him, like, right. oh, snap the head. You got to share the, that's it. I, I, you can't take the whole um, yeah. armrest. It's not happening. You want to take right. it for a little while, I take it for a little while, that's fine. But you ain't, you ain't getting it all. Yeah. But then again, I'm a little bit more aggressive, I, I would say. I would think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, before we go on with this uh, interview, Jeff, Curious, you know, you mentioned uh, Sue Feet the Hunter. You, you've uh, worked with her before? Uh, no, I actually haven't. She's like friends with me. My, my brother knows her. He's done some uh, events. My brother does DJing. Okay. So he's done some events with her. Um, I know her on Facebook. I, I've met her actually like twice, but nothing really. I never really talked to her. I got to work with her one time uh, in this, uh, the 2011 uh, New York uh, Paranormal Expo. Um, second site was actually, um, we, we aired it live. Um, I led an investigation. I gave a lecture. Um, I did a couple other things at the expo. Um, how I did a gallery reading and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, when we were doing the, the um, when I was leading the investigation, they actually put, which blew me away, they put CC with me and they put um, uh, Rick Hayes with me. Like Rick was Rick Hayes, you know Rick? No. He's phenomenal. He's really phenomenal. And he's a well-known person. And they put them with Second Sight. And which I think is really cool because, you know, they're, they're very, very popular people. Especially back then, not a lot of people knew me all that well back then. And, um, you know, I got to work with them. And they were so nice. And they were so um, easy to work with. And, and, and especially Rick Hayes, who was a, a famous psychic medium, you know, he does a lot of gallery readings, really well known and, and whatnot. And he treated me like, like an equal. And CC treated me like an equal. And we got some amazing evidence that night. And uh, I just, I was just wondering if you would had uh, ever investigated with her because I thought, I thought she, she did it the right way. Yeah, no, I have to have gone to the Sausage King that night to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, okay. we're, you know, we're coming up on, I can't believe it's already almost 9.30 Eastern time, and uh, our guest tonight is the wonderful Jeff Legere. Uh Jeff, why don't you tell our listeners uh, about the coaching work that you do and uh, tell them how they can get in touch with you and find out more about that service. Okay. Um, well, my website is angelsguide.org, and I have some... Um, I have some nice coaching packages on there now that, you know, they, they involve numerology, but I actually just came up with a new one that I'm really excited about. It's about belief. It's about, you know, I, I actually just put an article. If you want to go to my website at, at angelsguide.org, I just put a whole website up. There's it, actually my front static page on it, and it talks about all beliefs, how all beliefs can kind of portray themselves as, as your reality, and it, it's like, um, I don't know, like the article was really good. I, I wrote it really well. I'm really happy with it. But it's basically, you know, when you're in a belief that is kind of like keeping you down, it what, what can happen is, um, you know, a false belief and what it does is it attaches to your survival mechanism. So it, it attaches to your fight or flight, whereas, you know, one of your true beliefs that keeps you to yourself, you know, your true self, that, that will, you know, that will keep you in a high vibration. But, you know, I mean, like I was, you know, like what we're saying is what vibration were you putting out on the plane? It's the vibration that, you know, we're in a vibrational world. So it's basically... You know, it's like whatever vibe we're putting out. But, I mean, what happens with a negative belief is it locks into you and it becomes that voice inside your head where it's like you have no choice and, you know, Absolutely. It, uses, it uses weapons on you. It uses, you know, rejection, paranoia, like where people will try to talk to you and you don't listen to them. Uh, it justifies itself. It actually rewards itself saying that, you know, like let's use, for example, you're worthless and you don't belong and all this stuff. So, I mean, what the false belief will do 
and it'll it'll use it as a reward. It'll say, well, you know, because if you go outside looking, you know, if you go looking outside and you actually find out you are worthless, then what will you be? You'll just annihilate yourself, and that'll be it. You know, so you may as well stay right here, and that's your reward. You can stay right here and live in the miserable life that you're living. And, I mean, because, you know, everything in the universe is pretty much split down the middle. There's the dark and there's the light. When you're in the dark, the door to the light is hidden because it, it wants to keep you there. But, I mean, and that's the way that the mind works. It, it's basically your mind is made to protect you. It's made to keep you out of harm. I mean, that's the fight or flight that we have in it. So it doesn't want you to go and leave the safety of your comfort zone. It doesn't want you to go on and look into other things and see what's going on on the other side. Whereas when you're in the light and you're in a higher vibration, the dark, you know, it's, it's just a choice. It's just one of the infinite choices that you have. It becomes just another choice. You know, I think I think you just hit upon it for me. I think that was a test for me. And uh, I, so a few people have said to me, you know something, you're, you're a very kind person, but we never mistake your kindness for weakness. And I've been told that many times. And I think what that was about for me today is that this guy was doing something that I would like to have done, but you know what? In the long run, it doesn't matter. And I was okay with everything the way it worked out. It wasn't about being – it was about being accepting and, and not getting – hung up on something that was actually not, not not important at that time. Yeah. So, I mean, it's basically it's just something to look at and let go. Yeah, I mean, what I was thinking is, you know, as you were looking at that seat and saying, oh, cool, I have this whole seat, and you might have been sending out a subliminal message to other people and saying, oh, I'm going to take this seat. I hope, all right, let's let this light go, let's get this light going, and all of a sudden the universe is up. Oh, they actually, they actually reopened the door of the plane to let this guy in. I mean, they had actually closed the door already, and they oh, really? to let this guy in. It was amazing. But I bet you any money when you open the door, you're like, oh, he's going to sit near me. <laughs> no, no, actually, I did not. No, no, I was kind of surprised that they opened the door because usually once the door is sealed, that's it. They, you know, uh, so that's it. Yeah, yeah, no. But, no, no, but, no, I'm not, I'm not that petty. So, I mean, I basically, I, I mean, I, I've been researching this, you know, beliefs. I've been, like, watching, I've been reading. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I've been, I've been like, reading uh, Wallace Waddles and going way back to all that stuff and, and just putting it all together. And, I mean, I, I also made a one discovery that, you know, we're in this universe where we're expanding, and, you know, it's expansion. So... What you need to do is, you know, if, if you're in the dark and you get to the, to the light, which if you can look at these false beliefs and say, these are not my beliefs, I adopted these as I was growing up or I learned them from somebody or the media, but I mean, these beliefs, it's like these people are like uh, therapists and stuff. I'm not knocking therapists because they're wonderful people, but they're like, oh, you need to let them go. It's like they're not going anywhere. Basically, when you're in the light, a false belief just becomes a choice, but it stays with you. You give it the same choice that all of your other choices are. It's like it's an equal choice, and then it'll go away. It's like so you Jeff, can't get rid of it. So, Jeff, let's say I'm in a rut. I don't like the job I have right now. Maybe I have a crappy relationship. I come to you. This is the type of service you'll provide for me. Is that correct? Yeah, whatever. I need help, wealth. Relationships, everybody has a problem in 103. Okay. You know? So it's, it's, you know, as you talk to the people and I read their energy and I see what they really need, then that's what I do is, you know, I, I focus on that. And like I was saying before, the life coaching, it's not me solving that problem, it's me coming up with powerful questions that will click something in their mind and it's, they'll get to solve it themselves. And your website again for people who want to reach out for that service is? It's angelsguide.org. And over the winter, I'm going to really start putting stuff on. I've been playing with videos now, and I'm, you know, I'm going to go crazy on it. Because, it's, right. you know, winter's my slow time because I have the construction company. Right. So, I mean, after a day like today, it's, I'm all for getting in there and just doing some videos and getting that thing going. And, you know, it's Good for you. 
you know, I mean, I love my construction company. I'll always do it, but, you know, I want to kind of split the difference right now. So, I mean, that's kind of what I'm shooting for. And you're fortunate. getting more and more popular about the uh, life coaching. I'm getting <laughs> And you know something? You're fortunate to be able to do it, and you're making that for yourself. You're actually creating that, which is wonderful. That's part of the law of attraction. You're creating what you want. Yeah, it's, I wanted to basically be able to split where, you know, I'll take a couple of weeks, I'll do a construction project, and I can write out my clients. I mean, it works out good, too, because, you know, most of my clients, they like, you know, they're 40 minute sessions. They, that, I have no problem. Sometimes I usually go about 60 minutes to, like, to get what time it is. But. It's, you know, it works out good. But, I mean, I love the construction because I love the physical part of it. I love the problem-solving of it. And it's, you know, I love the hanging out with the crazy guys and saying, oh, I'm glad my life is like that. <laughs> nice guys, you know? You, you know, it's really funny because my day job is uh, I work with the, in the welding supply and compressed gas industry, and I deal with all kinds of people in construction and Steel demolition, steel erection, uh, the bridges here in New York City are all being rebuilt. Those are all our customers. Yeah. And I do the same thing. I hang out with them. I solve their problems. And at night, I do this stuff. So it's, uh, yeah. we, we, we really have well, a lot in common. They, you think that construction people are dumb, but, I mean, they're some of the shrewdest people you ever want to meet. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Right about. And you're listening to Second Sight Radio on the DTMWicked.com radio network. Uh, and at TeslaWolfMedia.com, for those of you who'd like to see what our beautiful faces look like. And, Chris, I don't care what you say. You have a beautiful face. Yeah. I'm, I'm a happy face. I mean, let's go what it is. I didn't say that. I said you had a beautiful face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. All right, listen, Jeff. You know, I want to know, how did your experience with the paranormal lead to life coaching and a law of attraction well, it led to it when I was telling you, you know, I was at Park Down, and the first time we went, it, you know, we kind of got pushed out, and, and we didn't really know what our energy could do, and, and then at the, at the second point, you know, we fought back, and I just realized I could use my energy to, to push it and get it out, and then I, I just started to think that. I mean... What is, you know, the, the universe is basically, it's, I, I just I just started to learn it from there. And then, um, then actually, no, if you want to go back even further, it was back when my ex-wife, when, when we had that thing where she threw me out and, and I started to talk to God and yell at him and I started to get answers. So, I mean, that's basically where it really all started. Because, I mean, that, that was, um, you know, I was telling you guys that she pulled the fake restraining order on me. And she would say that I was, I was like, beating her and stuff. And that's like, I never touched her in my life. So, I, I just, life was going crazy at that point. I mean, I was, my business was failing and, you know, everything was just going wrong. And I'm like, where are we? What's going on here? And then that was the final step. And I mean, like I was telling you guys, I was like homeless for like a week, I was sleeping in my van. So I went to the beach that night, and I was just screaming. It was a pour. It was raining out and pouring, and I was just screaming at God. I was swearing at him. I was like, what is going on? You know, what what have I done to deserve this? And it just started going crazy, and. So and then I, I just got back on my car and went to my court date the next couple of days. And her lawyer, she, she came up to me and she's like, "Oh well, you know, you should just plead guilty." But I didn't do anything. She goes, "Well, just plead guilty because no one ever wins these cases. Just end it." So I went up there and by the will of God, my wife gets snapped and she went crazy on the stand and all this stuff. And the judge says, "Oh, you'll be able to see your kids again at four today." And I mean, like I was telling you guys, I mean, one in 10,000 or 100,000 get a restraining order because all a judge needs to do is let a restraining order go and something happens and they're looking at him because he let it go. So, I mean, he knew without a doubt that it, it was false. So from there, you know, my sister, I, I actually ended up living with her for a while. She goes, here, read this book. And she gave me the book. It was The Secret. Yeah, right. about. Right. So I started like reading that, and 
I, I read it like three or four times, and I just kind of read it over and over and over again. And I'm like, wow, these are like ideas that I've never even like really thought of. So, you know, I started to apply it, and then from there, I got into, like I was telling you guys, I started reading, you know, Wallace Waddle, I started reading Think and Grow Rich, but it's like all the books weren't really connecting with me, you know, but, you know, certain ideas were and certain ideas weren't, so I just kept reading and reading and reading, and, you know, I started looking, reading more, I mean, I even started to, to read the Bible and, and read the, you know, the positive things in that, like, you know, the, the mustard seed thing, and you know, the man wants to move a mountain, you I'm like, what the Bible even talks about this? And it was like all kind of like, everything was, it's, I was in a different vibration, so I didn't see it that way at that point. So from there, I started to, you know, really get into it. And, you know, I, I mean, I just read so much about the law of attraction and that I, well, you know what, I'm going to take a test and I'm going to become a, practitioner on this, and I mean, that's how I took the test. I mean, I studied it for, I mean, I was ready to take it, like, right away. I had read so much, you know I mean? But it's, it's funny how when you get into that vibration, the stuff that you want will come. Absolutely. And it's basically, you can't go, like, looking. It's, it's, you, you need to keep your vibrations high, and you can't be specific. And, I mean, the best thing to do is be general with it. Like, you can't say, okay, I'm going to find my lover today. And, you know, you just you just go about being general and look at the good things that come to you. And, I mean, it's, it's a game. Life's a game. That's that old philosophy, and this is a wonderful uh, segue to this because we talked about that gap in time that many of us have, that we start out spiritually, start out, aware, start out empathic, psychic, whatever it might be, and there may be a gap, a period of 10 or 15 or 20 years where things sort of go away, or not go away, to sort of put on the back burner and then reemerge. There's a concept in Buddhism called readiness in time, which basically says that we have to go through a certain number of experiences to make us ready for that great leap, that new, that new, uh, uh, what, what's the word they use, the new paradigm that we're trying to achieve. And um, until you've gone through those experiences, you're not ready. Um, and you take one of those experiences away, and you may never be on that path. Yeah. But if you allow it to flow, like you talked about in Celestine Prophecy, if you allow each of these steps to flow, each of these insights to flow, uh, it prepares you, and the synchronicities will happen, and then you can launch yourself into that new that new energy. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, you know, like, um, you know, one of my questions I have to you guys is, you know, why don't affirmations work and all this stuff? It's because, you know, like, like you were saying in our last show, it's because it's the intent that you put into them. Absolutely. I mean, well, I don't think it was a technique where, you know, I put myself, you know, under a self-hypnosis, which is basically meditating. Right. And then I'll use the affirmation because I'm getting past the the inner gatekeeper that is, you know, your your conscious mind, which is going to, it, it, it's going to just throw those thoughts right out if you're just kind of bouncing them off them. But I mean, it's, that's what I do at night is before I go to bed is I'll use, I'll do my affirmations. I'll get into that sleep right before, you know, right before sleep and before you're actually sleeping. And then I'll just kind of go to sleep with them. And, you know, I wake up, I feel great most mornings. So I mean, but it's, it's the gatekeeper of your conscious mind that, I mean, if you're just saying affirmations like, oh, I, I would love to be rich. I would love to do that. I mean, it's, you just they're not doing anything because you're not putting the intention into them. You're not putting feeling into them. Yeah, you know, I, I want to touch on the secret a little bit more. Um, back in the day, I would say maybe back in the day, maybe five years ago, uh, my business kind of failed and um, money was tight and. You know, I was making a lot of money, but I was lending a lot of money to, you know, family and friends and whatnot. And um, I, I, it was summertime, and, I, and my kids always went to this, uh, the best camp, basically, in Brooklyn is, is called a uh, Motivation Day Camp, okay? And it's a big camp, and they do so many different things and whatnot. And I couldn't afford to send my two girls that, yeah, it was $4,500. I didn't have an extra $4,500 to send them to camp. My daughter, my oldest daughter, Jessica, was devastated. She says, oh, no, I'm going. 
and to Jessica, you know, you're not going because I don't have the money to put you in the system. He said, Dad, I've been watching the scene for four weeks. <laughs> I'm telling you, me and Nicole are going to camp this, you know, this summer. And he said, well, you do what you got to do. I said, I don't know how much I believe in the secret, but if you think it works, go for it. So she's doing it, and, and every day she come up and she goes, I'm going to camp. I'm going to camp. I'm like, I'm in the bagel store one Sunday morning getting bagels for the family. And who is behind me? The owner of the camp, okay? Really nice guy. Um, my age, my daughter goes to school with his daughter. Uh, my daughter's actually protected her daughter, his daughter who got bullied all the time. So he really loves Jessica uh, because she really protected his, his daughter. And he says, well, you know, Chris, I, you know, you and Rosemary have to come in to sign the papers and put your kids in camp. I said, well, honestly, they're not coming to camp this year. I said, I, I just I just can't do it this year. He goes, what do you mean you can't do it? No, camp is a camp without your daughters. You know, they belong there. I said, I, I agree with you, they belong there, but I can't do it. He says to me, come in today. Uh, I mean, Monday, tomorrow, you know, in the afternoon, speak to me. He goes, your kids are going to camp. I said, I don't know how it's going to happen, but okay. So myself and Rosemary go in the next day. He says, sign your papers, get your, your kids in medical. He says, they don't have to pay. He said, your kids are going to camp this year for free. Nice. Okay? Now, you have to understand, my oldest daughter, they go on uh, six three-day trips a summer. My oldest, my middle daughter, my younger daughter, would go on three getaway trips, you know, for a day. It be for everything. I went home and I told uh, my daughter, I said, oh, Jessica, you're not going to believe this. She just said, you're going to camp, aren't we? I said, you know, the fifth day you go, you're going to camp. And she was like, I told you, Dad. She said, don't ever doubt me. And uh, that's my secret story. So. Hey, that's, I mean, everybody has a story. I mean, that's a good one, though. Yeah, she annoyed me with it. She annoyed me with it, but she she got it. <laughs> yeah, because she had the intent. And I mean, look at all the synchronicities that happened. The guy was behind you. Yeah, right. we started talking about camp, and you know, from there, it's, you know, yep. it was a foregone conclusion. I, I remember going home suddenly with those bagels, and I didn't say nothing to Jeff to in the call. And I was married at the time, and I said, Rosemary, I said, I have a feeling that these kids are going to camp. And she says, Chris, it, it can't happen. You can't do it. I said, listen, it, it's happening. I, Jessica's right. It's happening. And the next day, she said, yeah, they're going to camp. And that was that. So it was pretty cool. Yeah. Was really Jeff, you were talking before about hypnosis, and I know that the hypnosis is part of the work that you do. How does hypnosis work? Hypnosis is, like I was telling you about, it, it gets – beyond the conscious mind into the subconscious. And, I mean, that's what you plan. I mean, basically, like I was telling you earlier, if your beliefs, and it's not like you can go up to a, a girl and say, you will have sex with me, you will have her beliefs. I can do that. that. Chris does that. Chris does that all the time. I just back the baby girl. Listen, I got the baby blues and that's it. I got them. That's it. There is a there is 20% of the population that will do that, but I won't get into that. But. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I got my girlfriend. I just looked at her and I said, you're my baby. She says, okay. There is 20% of people that that will work on. But anyway, uh, so anyway, so it's basically you get into, you know, their subconscious and you just tell them to release their beliefs that are, that are blocking them. And I mean, it's, it's, you know, and then you got to basically just close it out. I mean, I, I do mostly, I'll do some, but it's hard because it's, unless I'm face-to-face, I mean, I can do it on Skype or I could do it like, uh, I, had, I actually I do have a trick that works. I use it on my ex-wife when she's not getting crazy and mad at me. It's what you do is you take your finger like this and you match their, their heartbeat. You match their pace. You go fast. You go like this. This is to all the listeners out there. If you have someone like your kid that's going crazy, this was um, Erickson who basically invented modern hypnosis. He, I learned about this from his book. He, he was like the, the modern day father of the new hypnosis. So what you do is you tap your finger and you go like that. So 
as they're getting, you know, and then what you do is slowly slow it down, and you slow it down a little more, and you slow it down. And what they're doing is their subconscious mind is relating to you because it, it makes you think that you're a one with them. So what they're doing is they're looking at that, and it's like, oh, we can trust, you know, we can trust him. And like my ex-wife, we were talking about the kids before school, and she's like, hey, you did that, you did that. At the end of the night, we were laughing, talking about old memories. They only last for like a week, though, or two weeks. So you need to get <laughs> After two weeks, you have to be who she was. But, I mean, if, if you have a kid or if you have someone that is really hyperactive in your family, and you can do that. But, I mean, it has to be kind of like hidden. It has to be like that, a subconscious thing. But, I mean, if you can just tap your thing and you match their, their um, heartbeat and their breathing, and you just slow it down, slow it down, slow it down, it's like they'll calm right down. It's amazing. Yeah. It's just, I'm, I'm going to spread it out. Yeah. Do you also do you also do NLP, neuro linguistic programming? Yeah, I'm beginning. To, I'm studying it, and I do some of it. So I mean, that's amazing too. It's all working. I mean, basically, that's what media is. That's what Coca-Cola commercials are. They're, you know, they they brand themselves and they put their, you know, suggestions into your mind. I mean, they'll actually make you get up, and if you're just kind of watching out of the corner of your eyes, you go get a coke. The story of Erickson is actually very interesting. Erickson was wheelchair bound, right? I think he was, yeah. And and what happened was he found that if he used certain speech patterns, he could get people to do things for him. Oh and yeah. That's how the Ericksonian hypnosis started. Yeah. But like I said, that's not everybody. I mean, there's there's different people that, you know, if. I mean, you know what the sad side is? I mean, there's some people that won't be hypnotized because that's their intention. So they'll, they'll come to you and then, you know, you'll try to hypnotize them and they'll like, oh, it didn't work. I'm like, no, it did work because that was your intention to not be hypnotized. That's right. So it's, that's like, exactly it's, 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 it's like when somebody sits across from you and you give them a reading, they do the, okay, read me. And they block everything off of themselves. Yeah. yeah, you, yeah. You, you didn't want a reading. You came here to yeah. be a, you know. A pain in the ass. You didn't want real reading. You wanted to do some extra precise. Yeah, and that's the same thing. thing. You know, what you say to them, it's like, you know, you got exactly what you wanted because you, you didn't, you didn't, you left with exactly what you wanted. Give me my money. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you think about it, I mean, do you believe that there's other planets and stuff? Yes, yeah, yes. I, I do believe they're all the planets. I do believe that they're aliens. I do believe they walk amongst us, you know. Uh, but um, I don't believe that when I'm channeling, that I'm channeling from the middle world. Uh, uh -huh. I believe I'm channeling spirit. I, I, uh, not alien spirit. I've never channeled alien spirit before. I know people who claim to have. We, we had Anya Briggs on, on the show. Remember Anya? Yep. You know, she's, you know, she claims to uh, she channel... Is. Yeah, I, and a lot of people don't believe. It. A lot of people really rip into her, and and she has a lot of um, a lot of headbutting going on because of her beliefs. Now, do I believe it? I don't know. I mean, I've never, I've never. I was with Anya one time, but she, when I, when I was with her, she she didn't do any channeling. I did the channeling that night, and, and and I always wanted to see her do it because I know right away she was full of it or not. Um, I get the impression that she really. Um, that she believes she is. So everything starts with belief, you know? So I, I, I don't know what I believe in Anya. I, I, you know, and that's the only person that I know of personally that, that claims to, to uh, channel aliens. But to, oh. to, Jeff's, to Jeff's point, um, as long as the message that she brings through is a valid message and a worthwhile message, the source really doesn't matter. Now, okay, okay, but, okay. But, uh, I agree with that. I know a guy, um, and... One day he was just a regular guy, and the next day he's channeling. And when he channels, he starts going, and I am somebody from, and, and he puts like this crazy voice. And, and so he's such a great talker and so eloquent with his words. And, and even when he's talking like that, it was, it was ridiculous. Now, I knew he wasn't channeling anybody, but the messages he was giving. They were really good. I mean, it was things that were thought provoking. People were listening to him, but it wasn't channeled. It was him making a fake voice and just giving great messages. So, 
there's a fine line there. there. There's a lot of people out there who do that type of work. They talk like an, an ancient Indian uh, 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 guru, where they talk like uh, uh, they're from uh, with a British accent, for example. They're, mm-hmm. they're Americans and talk with a British accent. Right. It, I, honestly, in, in my opinion, if the message is valid and it has meaning for someone, then I don't question what the source is. You know, I, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. My only, my only uh, problem with it is, you know, why do you got to put the act on? Why can't you give that message without making the fake voice? You know, that's that's just my my thing with it. I, the concept I, is I, that the concept is is that a different personality is stepping in or walking in. They call walk-ins and so right. on and so forth. And maybe that's it. You know. It, 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 it doesn't invalidate the message. Maybe it, it's theatrics. Maybe it isn't theatrics. I don't know because I've never done it that way. Maybe yeah. they're just maybe they're just like triggering off a different part of their mind. Exactly. Exactly. Possibly. Possibly. You know, like maybe it's it's just like a part of their their subconscious that they're triggering. But yeah, I know. I, I see those too. Like even like Abraham Hicks. You know, yeah. it's. Uh, but I mean, their messages are, are wonderful. Great well, I mean, wherever they're getting their messages from, I bet it really doesn't matter. Like you said, that guy, he thought funny, but he had a good message, and the people were engaged with him. Phenomenal. Phenomenal message. But, he, you know, I know it was just him making a fake voice, you know? <laughs> and, and I like the guy. I like him a lot. He's a really great guy. Um, and, and I've actually brought that up to him. And, and, you know, he won't admit to it, and he just kind of smiles and whatnot. And I tell him, listen, you know, you don't have to make that crazy voice to give those great <laughs> messages. I said, I know that it's not real. And he just kind of smiles, and he's like, let me do what I got to do. And, and, and he leaves it at that. But um, and I like that, too. I, I love the message that he gives. I just don't like the, the, the fake voice. And, <laughs> so. and speaking of messages, we've got about a minute and 30 seconds left. Jeff, what's your message for our listeners tonight? My message is, what are you just going to do out They have some good stuff on there. There you go. <laughs> no, my message is basically... Um, I don't know. It's, I mean, I've been really into this belief thing lately. It's, it's like, I mean, that's the core to all problems. I'm, I mean, I'm beginning to, the more I research into it, it's releasing these false beliefs and realizing what are your own beliefs. So, I mean, whatever you need to do to do that, if you need to go to my website, yeah, if you need to just have this idea, just quit. And it makes you want to go somewhere else to look for it. Just, I mean, that's, that's the next step is to, just clear up these beliefs that are holding you back. That's right, they're anchors. Great they're advice. Anchors. Absolutely great advice. And, you know, listen, Jeff, thank you for being on the show. Um, we know we're definitely going to have to have you back. We didn't get to even half the questions that we wanted to get to. But that always makes it the best show. Because yeah. once we start ripping and, and going off on our own little things, that's yeah. the, best, the best radio show. It's like a conversation between three old friends. It's not yeah. a radio show. It's really like a conversation. Well, it's kind of like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, I turned 46 and all of a sudden now there's three old people. Uh, all right, one old guy and two younger guys. What do you want me to say? <laughs> Come on. Hey, so I'm older than you, so. There you go. All right. Well, listen, I think we're three young guys, and it's been a great show, and we're here every week making the unbelievable believable. Victor, who's our guest next week? Our guest next week is Andrea Messick, the author of the book, The Ghost in the Coal Cellar. Nice. Should be a great show. Uh, Jeff, again, thank you for being on the show. Thank you, everybody, and good night. Good night, everybody. Take care. Good night.